All right, buddy, it is so lovely to see you. We go way back, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. We've known each other for a minute, buddy. Yes. Do you remember where we first met? I believe that was my, f was it before Winsport? No, I was at Winsport. I saw you guys in your pajamas doing a photo shoot. There were four or five of you. <laughs> it was Rebecca Johnston, Jill yes. Sonye, Ariane Jones, Paige Lawrence, who's one of my, well, all of those folks are some of my best friends, but we were doing a pajamas like Christmas shoot. I don't even know why. I, I thought it was super, I think I was the only other person in the gym that day. And then there was a five or six of you over there wearing your onesies or whatever it was, doing a photo shoot and I don't know, I think that was a very funny memory and a lasting first impression, if nothing else. Like, how did we even have the time to do, like, I, uh -huh. I long for those days where I could just wear a onesie and be like, yeah, let's do a photo this shoot my in this life. gym. <laughs> I was now, just jealous that I didn't get the memo, because I for sure would have showed up in my pajamas that day and left I'm it. sorry. Let's redo it, yeah. Holidays 2023, we're gonna redo it. <laughs> Legacy photo shoots. Legacy photo at Winsport. The OG Winsport athletes. <laughs> When I was chatting to you uh, the other day, though, I said, what do you want to talk about? And right away, you're like, accessibility. So I have my own assumptions. Okay. But where do you want to start? Um, it's just something I'm passionate about. I mean, I want to see this world become a little more accessible for everybody so we can all experience it equally, um, whether that be... I went to school for architectural technology, so I can hopefully play a role in making, whether that be Calgary, a little more level, a little more accessible for people not even just with disabilities, but just so everybody can access it. Um, and then hopefully expand that to make Canada a little more flat, a little more wheelchair friendly, a little more whatever it happens to be. Um, and then hopefully we can kind of be world leaders in that and set an example for other countries. Because I know I've traveled a lot. Canada is ahead of a lot of countries in that aspect. Um, obviously being a newer country, we don't have the four and 500 year old buildings, so that's not yeah. gonna be <laughs> as much of an issue for us, but uh, just leading, leading that example for the rest of the world so they can catch up and hopefully improve access for other people around the world that, uh, that could benefit from it. Architectural technology. technology. You bet. That is so fascinating. So like where is your, I mean, accessibility certainly, but where is your passion point? Like where would you want to start kind of your, uh, your work? So part of it is I have a bit of a creative side, even looking back. I can like, tell by the fashion choices. He's a shocker. Come on. Even looking back as far as like being a kid playing with Legos or my grandfather was a draftsman. So I guess a, a bit of it runs in the family. But I would like to somehow maybe get into some sort of accessibility consulting mm -hmm. or even just designing new buildings to make sure. I mean, you can have an architect or an engineer try and design something that they think is accessible, but they've never really don't have any lived experience they've never spent a day in their life in a wheelchair or having a visual impairment or there's so many things that you can plan for and there's minimum codes that you need to meet now that kind of meet our standards but just barely or they almost work whereas focusing on some better practices to make it just easier to access and even like if it's a ramps it's not just for somebody in a wheelchair but like mothers pushing a stroller can benefit from it or like mm -hmm. it makes it makes the world a little easier for everybody to get around if you uh, you design it right the first time and not design something and then you have accessibility as an afterthought where you need to install ramps and they stick out and they're not as appealing or yeah. whatever it is. I'm going to assume that we have become more accessible as a society, mm -hmm. but what is an area that really frustrates you when you talk about this overarching conversation? Uh, I think if we could retrofit some older buildings, a lot of times it's not uh very financially accessible mm -hmm. i mean something as simple as putting installing a button on a door to open it can cost thousands of dollars so um buildings built after a certain year i don't know the exact year but uh need to be accessible but if we could start retrofitting older buildings from the 70s and 80s and uh, i mean like, like i said funding is an issue but uh finding ways to to make that more accessible for businesses because then too you're opening your doors to to more clients and i mean word of mouth i'd rather support a business that allows us to access it than looking up at a coffee shop where there's six stairs to get in and go i, I want a coffee but i don't want a coffee that badly <laughs> yeah yeah i lived in a city a few years ago that has a, a tremendous underground subway system mm -hmm. and i'll admit to my own privilege 100 percent. i walked into the subway 
and it had a big poster that said, this is what this subway line looks like to folks that can't use stairs. And all of a sudden, it was a really crappy subway system. So as someone who is able-bodied um, and does not have you know, a, a mobility issue in the slightest, what can we do to be better allies and to kind of further educate ourselves and to further this conversation? Because when you have the privilege, like it's, it's sometimes really hard to take your brain out and, and realize, wow, this is not an accessible place for other people. Yeah, I think you're already ahead of the pack by, like you said, just being an ally and giving us a platform to, to raise awareness because it's not something that people realize. But even especially something like transit, because a lot of people with disabilities may not be able to drive themselves around. So that way it gives them a little bit of freedom or at least they can go and get on a bus that's accessible or access a subway station where it's not every eight or 10th stop. You mm -hmm. can get out in a wheelchair. Otherwise you get off a train and you're stuck in a basement with a flight of stairs to get out. Yeah. Equality and equity. It's another conversation that a lot of folks are having right now. What does that look from your standpoint as a Paralympian? Apologize in advance if I get equality and equity mixed it's okay. up. This is a safe space. <laughs> Don't even worry. Um, I think that's part of it is just seeing even people like that's part of the accessibility side of it for me is mm -hmm. making sure that everybody can experience the world in an equal manner. I mean, I, I lived in an apartment building that was brand new and they had made it so it was accessible. I could get into my apartment, there was an elevator to get to my floor, and we had a rooftop patio and the elevator went up to the top floor but not to the rooftop. And so there was barbecues up there. I spent a lot of time hauling myself and my wheelchair up this extra flight of stairs, whereas yeah. something as simple as that extra one floor in an elevator could have made it a give it, I mean, like I said, we can, we can use the building for its function, yeah. but having like the extra amenities and everything that only certain people could use was a little disappointing to see. No, absolutely. And who doesn't love a barbecue? Exactly. I, st I still drag myself in my wheelchair up there to, to cook some steaks and some burgers. And... But it's ridiculous that you need to do that. <laughs> You've been around the block for a minute. What progress have you seen? You know, CPC, COC, Paralympics, the IOC. Where are we in that relationship? Are they coming together? We're heading in the right direction. I've been doing this for 12 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, we definitely saw some momentum leading up to the Toronto Games in 2015. Uh, that's where we really started to see some, some media coverage for Paralympic sport and getting the word out there, which has been huge. I mean, that's the biggest thing is if we can get exposure, we can get more athletes coming out trying sports and as somebody that's benefit hugely from sport and has changed my life, I, I would love to be able to offer that to more people. And sometimes it's just a matter of not knowing that there's a sport out there you can still compete in or you have a life-changing incident where you now use a wheelchair to get around or have some sort of limited ability and uh, there's still options out there to, to get out and get involved and be active. What's been overlooked in that conversation though? I still think we have a little bit of work to do considering Paralympics means parallel to the Olympics. It has nothing to do with paralysis or paraplegia um, and I think we have some catching up to do as far as still some of the the coverage or the funding that we receive, obviously. For I'm not, sure. I'm not one that likes to dwell on the have-nots. I like to be grateful for the things I have. And uh, just, I, I have nothing but gratitude for what I've experienced in my life and the opportunities that I gained. But I still think we have a little bit of a, a quality there that we could work on. From the grassroots level, mm -hmm. As I said, you've been around the block 12 years, bud. I know. That's a that. long time that. to be playing. <laughs> That's crazy to think of. Chair rugby. Also, I mean, I on your Instagram, your chair is like beat up. Yes, you can say that again. Beat up. That is scary. I, I am too much of a wimp to do your sport in any capacity. So I do have a brand new shiny one at home, but I'm saving that for closer to competition. So I'm just using this one and beating it up as much as I can. So I've got a freshie that's going to be at a peak performance when I, when I need it most. Gosh, so yeah, yeah, you've been around the block for a minute. Um, you know, what progress have you seen at the grassroots level? Are, are kids getting into para-sport in a way that they never have before? Something we're starting to focus on more and more and starting to realize the priority of is the recruitment and the development side. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're beginning to, uh, to become one of the older teams on the international circuit. 
So we've realized that if we don't start planning now, a couple of years down the road, if we have guys retiring and starting to drop off, that we might uh, we might notice our our ranking internationally change, and even just offering that opportunity for young athletes to to get them active, whether they want to be the next Paralympian or they just want to play recreationally and have fun and do it for uh, for the health benefits. I think there's still room for growth, and it's tough. It's tough to find people with disabilities because sometimes they're just they're not very involved in the community. It's a very low percentage of people with disabilities that are active. And so if we can find new ways to reach out and find those people and let them know what the options are and encourage them to come out, I think that needs to be a focus of ours. Well, you certainly have been a phenomenal spokesperson and are very encouraging. Um, I can't believe, I, I mean, I've been retired for six years in speed skating. And I'm like, what the kids can do now? I'm like, I never thought that was possible. So 12 years at this level, how have you seen wheelchair rugby progress? Like, I, I'm assuming technology, weights, periodization, like where do we even start? Uh, something really cool to see is the global growth right now in our sport. I mean, a few years ago, like up until Rio, mm -hmm. only Canada, USA, Australia and New Zealand, I believe, had medaled at a Paralympics. Uh, and then we saw Japan really step it up leading up to the Tokyo Games. So they medaled, they got a bronze in Rio. So they made a bit of a, a statement by stepping onto the podium there. And then Europe has really come along. Uh, Great Britain was the first European team in Tokyo to win a Paralympic medal, let alone become Paralympic champions. And so Canada, we've had a little bit of a dip in our rankings, and I don't think it's because we've dropped off at all, mm -hmm. but we're just seeing other countries start to catch up and develop. And South American teams now, there's a tournament going on there right now where there's five or six countries in South America, some of whom we haven't even seen play, but the fact that there's some, some new teams up and coming is very exciting to see. And so just watching a sport that started here in Winnipeg in the 1970s now being played in... It's over 30 countries. I don't know the exact number, but that's pretty cool to see uh, the impact it's had on the world. No, it absolutely is. And I mean, mm -hmm. you mentioned quickly just before we started, you're like, I just came back from Australia and Japan and you're playing in all these leagues across the world. Like, how do you even do that? Where, where are you playing and how do you do it? Uh, so last summer I was in Australia in their national championships. And a lot of times it's just teams reach out. Often you can import a player to come and help out. And if I'm getting a free trip somewhere to go play rugby, I'm not going to say no. And you're a star, bud. And it gives me the opportunity to travel. So, <laughs> so I'm not complaining by any means. Japan, I was over there a couple times last year. I had to play one tournament with them to be eligible to compete at their national championships. And we had to qualify, like our team, uh, to, to make it to the finals. So I was there in January. Uh, I'm playing for the Portland Pounders down in the U.S. League and obviously playing for Alberta at Nationals coming up in Moncton in May. I love your Alberta so. accent, by the way. <laughs> My Prairie accent's coming out just I talking know, to you. You no. hide it while you're out here, but... <laughs> no, as soon as I get around my Prairie folks, it just comes out. Uh, has it been getting easier or have you just been getting better? I mean, it's such a physical sport. 12 years is a, that's a ton of time to be at that level. That's a long time to play contact sports. It is, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say it's getting easier because I'm not getting any younger. I got a lot of miles on these uh, <laughs> on these bones, but as long as the uh, the body holds up, I'm gonna, I wanna stay involved at some capacity. I mean, I love what I do. Uh, I grew up a lacrosse player and playing contact sports. So that's obviously a big draw for me and part of the reason I got into rugby. And uh, yeah, as long as I'm able to, to keep going, I'd like to, whether that be in an athlete role, playing recreationally, or getting involved in coaching, or what that looks oh. like, we'll uh, see down the road. But because sport's given me so much in my life, I want to be able to uh, give back to the community and do what I can for future generations of athletes and the next Paralympians or just local players. You have had such a formidable career, and you are such a veteran and pillar of the team. How do you make you know your sport more accessible and, and perhaps a, a safe place for new folks that want to get into wheelchair rugby? Uh, something really cool that we've seen recently to draw out new folks is we just had a women's team 
playing over at the International Women's Cup in Paris last week. Mm -hmm. And so wheelchair rugby is a co-ed event, even at the Paralympic level, which is very cool because it's one of the few sports that offers that. And so we have some females on the international scene that are there for a reason. They're the, they're the best stars. in the world or in their countries and deserve to be there. Um, but that can be a little bit intimidating, I think, for some. So the fact that there are tournaments like this where it's all female tournaments and hopefully we can continue to see the growth in, uh, in our sport in, in those sure. numbers. Um, Australia just sent a team to Denmark in October that I believe had three women on it and won the gold medal. So we're starting to see more and more of them and we're hoping to see more and more uh, down the road, but it's, it's pretty cool to see, see opportunities like that starting to open up because that, that hasn't been going on for very long. Can, this was Canada's first team that was funded to go over there cool. as, a, as a women's team. So Very cool. Yeah. Well, para Pans, should we talk about that? Santiago, this fall, how is Team Canada feeling leading into uh, the Pan Ams? Uh, there's a little bit of pressure there. There's only one spot up for grabs to qualify at that tournament for the Paris Paralympics. Um, so us in the U.S. historically have kind of fought over that top spot. We've upset them a few times. Um, so it's it's a bit of a coin toss when we go head to head with them. And there are there are number one rivals dating back as far as the sport basically as being uh, being in the Paralympics. So that hasn't really gone down at all. We know it's going to be a tough battle. And like I was saying earlier, there's some South American teams that are coming up and uh, challenging the top teams in the world as well. So won't be an easy one, uh, but if uh, whatever teams don't qualify that should have a last chance qualifier sometime closer to Paris. But we just want to go to that, get it done right the first time, have a better idea of what our schedule looks like moving forward and only having that that one big tournament next year to, to peak for and prepare for. So, Do you guys practice a lot together? Or is it yes. decentralized or centralized team? We're decentralized, yeah. but when we start getting into things, it's about once a month we're together for a training camp for a week or so, or going to international tournaments. So this summer, after our club season ends, uh, we got a little bit of time off, and then we'll be going over to Paris in the summer for a little, little test event. Mm -hmm. Never been to Paris before, so I'm looking forward to that. Should it probably is. touch up on my French a little bit. Un peu, oui. Yeah, being an Albertan that... Missed most of the early years of learning French because I was in the hospital. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's room for improvement there. There's room for improvement. Um, no, that's, yeah. Okay, so you guys are going to be obviously practicing once a month. Um, and, and how are you feeling, like, going in? You said that there is some pressure. One spot in Para Pan Ams, and then it's the big show, Paris 2024. Uh, I, I try not to let the pressure get to me too much. I mean, I'm gonna go there, and we've got we've got a really strong squad. We've got some strong up and comers, some young new guys uh, in the program. So mm -hmm. hopefully, we get a, a couple fresh faces on the squad there. I know uh, there's some guys that have been working for a long time to earn that spot. We've got selections at the end of March here in Vancouver. So uh, I think we'll. Uh, I mean, it's always exciting when you get the new guys coming up to to motivate us. Us old boys, us veterans. You vets. Knowing that there's somebody else fighting for those spots. I'm not going to read your resume because it's going to embarrass you and I don't <laughs> want to do that. But you really, I'm looking at you and I, have had such a formidable career. What is different about your game that has set you apart for so long? Because 12 years, I mean, I've said that a few times. That's a long time to be playing such a physical sport, Zach. 12 years and I'm still one of the, I think I'm second youngest on the team still right now. Just a baby. You got another 16 years in you then, uh, then. We'll see. <laughs> Questionable. Um, I think part of it is I'm just out there having fun. I mean, at the end of the day, we're playing a game. And I told myself that, that if I'm not having fun, like, why am I doing it? So that's a big part of why I don't feel the pressure. I'm going out there. I'm trying to enjoy. I learned early on in my career that, I mean, win, lose, or draw, I might as well be out there enjoying the experience. And, yes, I'm competitive and I want to win. But at the same time, I don't want to come out of a, a competition if it doesn't work out for us and be just miserable and not taking anything positive away from it. Mm -hmm. So it makes it easier when, they're, when you're out there just playing. When you got that perspective. Have you ever lost it, though? I would lose that perspective all the time. My gosh, I'd put my self-esteem to my results and I'd be... <laughs> come as, on. As athletes, that's one of the yeah. big struggles is so much of our self-worth can almost be tied into our performance because it's what we do all day every day mm -hmm. um, but I've been working on uh, 
compartmentalizing those two things and win, lose, or draw, like I said, still enjoying the experience. Sometimes after a tough loss, um, you can be down for a little while. I've been, I know I've been, I kind of distance myself after after some of the, the, the tough draws. I know after uh, Rio, we had that, a lot of pressure on us coming in number one. Uh, we ended up falling just short of a medal. We lost to the Japanese in the bronze game. And at that point, I was a little bit burnt out and that didn't help. So I took some time off and went to school and got that out of the way. So it's one less thing to worry about. And then came back and we had uh, some fresh new faces to play with, which was fun. Some new uh, leadership with our program. And uh, I'm very glad I did come back to make a, make a push for Tokyo. Well, Cause you were even kind of questioning whether you were gonna continue. I was semi-retired, unofficially yeah. retired. Um, but we now have people, I mean, as a team, we have, we're, we're doing a better job of picking each other up after those losses and refocusing and just kind of banding back together and focusing on what's next. You also like we're a part-time Uber driver, bud. Do you drive a car the way you drive your wheelchair when you're playing wheelchair rugby? I like to think I'm very different when I'm behind the wheel of a car. <laughs> uh, I, I care about my car a little bit. Uh, knock on wood, I have never even been pulled over for a traffic violation in my however many years of driving. Um, so yes, when I was an Uber driver, I, people would they try and urge you to go a little bit quicker. I'll give you ten dollars if you if you speed and guys are faster. And I go, uh, I'm not no. doing that. I don't want my insurance going up or no way. having a pay ticket. So yeah, no, I was very responsible. I think as an Uber driver, but honestly, I love driving and I've flirted with that idea. It's a lot of fun. I'm always like, should I just like drive Uber with the no time I have? But I've like <laughs> really thought of that so many times, and so knowing that you've done that, it made it just puts a smile on my heart. Yeah. I'm the same way where I, I quite enjoy driving. I like talking to people, so that was a big part of it. I had some free time after Rio while I was waiting for school to start. Yeah. I have a new vehicle now that uh, would be eligible. Your vehicle needs to be like uh, less than 10 years old. Yeah. And so my vehicle got too old and I had to stop driving for Uber. But now that I have a new one, I've got a, a little bit of free time. But you can work your own schedule. So, I mean, if you yeah. don't have free time, it's not the end of the world. If you do have free time and you want to go out and drive you, around and make you a couple should, bucks. You should pitch that to like the Paralympic Committee. Uber driving with Zach Modell? Come on. Yeah. We'll, we'll make a podcast in my car with just strangers in the back seat. Why don't we do that today? Come on. Hey, what's next? next? Yeah, next time. But what's next now? Uh, next, uh, we have national championships coming up at the beginning of May. Uh, we've got tryouts at the end of this month. So that's the, the big focus. Uh, a bunch of the Canadian guys are playing in the U.S. League this year. Mm -hmm. So we'll be in Illinois at the end of April. Uh, so we got a couple tournaments to keep us busy. Uh, not a lot of Team Canada stuff while we're in the middle of the club season. And then, like I said, this summer we start ramping up for Pan Ams in Chile. What? So. And on the side, you got to be answering fan mail. Look at this. This is like this is the greatest piece of fan, not mail, but just like art. love art. This is one of the coolest birthday presents I've ever gotten. Coolest ever. From like for real. My friend KJ in the Philippines, I just met her in the Seattle airport on my way to Japan. As you do. In January. And uh, she was sending pictures of this in progress and then asked for my address so she could ship it up. And I came with a little little birthday note and everything. It was pretty cool. It's like a it's like a sewn miniature Zach. Crocheted tiny Zach and like a surprisingly accurate Wheelchair. rugby chair. Unreal. Uh, I don't even know how she did this. So. No, I don't know. I never got fan anything like that. <laughs> I appreciate you, my friend. It's always so uh, lovely to uh, see your face and reminisce in old times. Appreciate Again. you having me here. Oh, anytime. My gosh, bring him always.